Okay, in this video, we are going to look into the SPI interface bus on the AVR line of microcontrollers. Now, it's sometimes called the SPI interface bus, and it stands for Serial Peripheral Interface. And this interface was developed by Motorola in the mid 80s, and it's a synchronous serial protocol because there's an external clock involved. Now, it's a master slave relationship. And you can see on my breadboard, I have a nano on the left, that will be my master and the nano on the right will be configured as a slave. And I have the two grounds connected together on both nanos and there's four control lines. You can see the two top wires, that's your data and we've got a clock and we've got our slave select. So the master out is connected to the slave in and the slave out is connected to the master in. Those are the two data lines. And the clock from the master is connected to the clock input on the slave and the slave select line, the SS line, is grounded so now the slave is permanently enabled. Now normally when we have multiple slaves, the master will control the multiple slaves through the SS lines, but in this case I, I grounded it permanently. So the code would be a lot simpler. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to hook up uh, the two nanos to my computer through the USB ports, and I have a serial terminal program called TerraTerm, and I'll send data from the master over to the slave over the SPI bus. Okay, I have two windows open on my computer, and both windows are running TerraTerm, which is a serial terminal program, and the window on the left is connected to my master nano, and the window on the right is connected to my slave nano. So whatever I type on my keyboard, which is connected to the master nano, the ASCII character codes will be sent over the SPI link over to the slave nano, and they'll appear in the right-hand window. So it's transparent, so whatever I type on the keyboard on the left, Will be, will be echoed and we'll see them on the right window. So I have to run two programs, so I'll run test on my slave and I'll run test on my master. Now whatever I type on my master keyboard, you can see it's being echoed over to my slave. So now we have a, a, a serial link between the two, between the master and slave, and it's transparent. So whatever I type on my master, we can see on our slave. Okay, here's my setup where I connected the USB ports of the two nanos into my computer, running TerraTerm. So when I typed on my keyboard into the master nano, it entered the USB port, and it went from the USB to serial into the UART. Now the UART gave that character code to the SPI register in the microcontroller and that was sent over the SPI link into the SPI register of the slave nano. Now the SPI register of the slave nano is given to the UART and the UART goes through the FTDI into the USB connector and then back through into the computer into the slave window. So that's how we got our link from our master to our slave. So in this video we're, we're going to look at the code, how I sent uh, the data from the master over the SPI link into the slave. Okay, here's the block diagram of my setup. So on the left you can see the master nano and on the right you can see the slave nano. Now pin 11 on the nano is master out, slave in. Pin 12 is master in, slave out. Pin 13 is clock and pin 10 is SS, that's slave select, which is active low. Now basically you could hook up pins 11, 12, 13 and 10 together um, I opted out to ground out the slave select on the on the slave nano so it's permanently enabled but if you want you could hook up uh, pins 10 between the two. Now you notice there's some asterisks on some of the on some of the pins so when you enable the master nano uh, SPI the master in will be will be set up as an input will be forced as an input also on the slave when you enable the slave SPI pins 11 13 and 10 will be forced as inputs. Even though elsewhere in the code they're, they're set up as output GPIO, they'll be forced as inputs. But it's up to you to make master out an output, a clock output on the master, and make SO, the, the slave output, an output on the slave. You have to do that in your code. Now once you set it all up, uh, you're ready to go. There's a couple of things, uh, a couple of details. Uh, the SS is not being used on the master, so you could use it as a GPIO output. But make sure you set it up set it up as an output. If you make it an input and you drive that low, you'll turn this uh, nano into a, a slave, which would be kind of confusing. That trips up a lot of people, so make sure 
uh, your SS on your master is configured as an output. And the SS on the slave is grounded. That's your tri-state control. So when it's grounded, the data lines are, are active. If you drive the SS high, the data lines will go into high impedance. So you've got to make sure the SS is driven low to activate the slave uh, to keep it on permanently. So here's my setup there that I'm going to um, use in this video. Okay, here's the internal workings of the SPI bus. Now on the left, you can see the master SPI register. And on the right, you can see the slave SPI register. Now each register can only handle 8 bits or 1 byte. And the master out is connected to the slave in. And the slave out is connected to the master in. So this is basically a circular ring buffer. Now if we want to send data from the master over to the slave, we do it one bit at a time over the master out slave in serial line. So we send the first bit out and it's sent over into the slave SPI register. Now the slave register can only handle 8 bits, so this last bit will be punched out, will be bumped out, and it will come around back into the master shift register. Now we do the next bit, and it goes over, does the same thing, it enters the register, and the last bit gets, gets pushed out and comes around into the master uh, register. So after 8 clock pulses, the byte that was in the master shift register will be in the uh, slave shift register, and the byte that was originally in the uh, slave register will now be into the master uh, register. So they both traded uh, their bytes. So that's how we could get data from the master register over to the slave register using SPI bus. Okay, here's the status of our shift registers on the master and the slave before we actually do a data transfer. Now this is after one clock pulse, so now we have shifted one bit over to the slave register. You can see the one bit that's been shifted there and the bit has been pushed out is now in the master register. Now after four clock pulses, you can see we have four bits now has been shifted out into the master from the master to the slave and the four bits from the slave that came back into the master register. Okay, here's an active diagram showing the eight bits of the master register being clocked into the slave register. So after eight clock pulses, we have moved the full byte from the master to the slave. Okay, there are three registers we have to look at when we're programming the SPI bus. And the first one is the SPI data register, which we can see here. Now this register can hold eight bits or one byte, and it resides at hex 4E in memory. Now writing to the register initiates the data transmission, so it happens automatically. As soon as we write to this register, it starts shifting out to the slave. Now reading the register causes the shift register receive buffer to be read. So we read this register when we want to receive a byte. Now when we write to the register and it starts shifting out automatically, we have to wait till it's finished before we could write the next byte. Now to do that, we have to look at the next register. Okay, here's our next register. It's called the SPI status register. And the memory location is hex 4D uh, in RAM. So we want to look at bit 7, it's called the SPI interrupt flag, and when a serial transfer is complete, the SPIF flag is set. So when we write a byte in our data register and it starts shifting out, we have to wait until bit 7 of the SPI status register goes high before we could send the next byte. Okay, the last register is the SPI control register, and the memory location is hex 4C in RAM. Now bit 6 enables or disables the SPI function. Bit 5 is the data order. So either the least significant bit or the most significant bit is shifted out first. Bit 4 sets the master and sl a slave select. Bit 3 is the clock polarity uh, when the clock is idle. Bit 2 is the clock phase. And bits 0 and 1 set the clock rate, how fast uh, the clock is going to shift out uh, the data. So we set all this up in our code. Okay, here's the code running on my master nano, and it's written in Flashforth, so it's interactive, and it makes it easy to develop. So the first thing we see there are the four pins that we're using on the nano, pins 10, 11, 12, and 13. Uh, the next bit of code, I'm assigning names to the address locations of those three registers, the control, status, and data register. 
Now the next bit of code, I'm just setting and resetting bits in those three registers. For example, SPI enable. So what I'm doing there, I'm setting bit six of the control register and that will enable the SPI on the microcontroller. So tomorrow I won't remember what bit does what, so I assign that to the name SPI enable. So when I just type that on the command line, it will enable the SPI. Also SPI disable. Uh, which bit is going to be sent first? Uh, master and slave mode. So we set up which uh, mode that we want. And then we go down. There's four modes in the SPI. Mode 0 to 3. So mode 0 is the most common. And the clock is 0 when it's idle. So it's low when it's idle. And sampling is on a leading edge. So sending data or, or receiving data, each bit, uh, it will sample on a leading edge. And we can go through the four modes, mode 0 to mode 3. And the next is the clock speed. So we're setting bits in the control register. So F -os oscillator, that's the 16 megahertz oscillator of the Arduino Nano. And it's divided by 4 or 16 or 64 or 120 depending what we want and the bits are set accordingly. So we just have to type that in our code if we want uh, the oscillator to be divided by 64. Now when we send a byte we have to wait until bit 7 of the status register goes high. So this is what wait for SPIF where it is. So it's going to begin it's going to be in a begin until loop and it'll loop in this it will be continuously looping until bit 7 is set or goes high then it will jump out of this loop so this is our main word SPI write so we take a value and we write it to the data register which will start shifting out then we wait for the SPIF bit to go high meaning we can send another one and then we'll read what's come back because whenever we send something we get a byte back because it's in a circular buffer and that will read what we get back and in this case, it could be just garbage, so we'll just delete it if we're, if we're writing uh, to the slave. So here's my main word test that I used that we saw in the video. So first thing I do is init SPI, which will run all this. So we set it for master mode. MSB is first, first bit to be sent out. It's in mode 0. We're dividing by 64, the oscillator. Then pin 10, 13, and 11 are outputs. Then we enable the SPI. That's what that does. Then we go into a begin again loop. So in this loop, it's reading the key on the keyboard. So it takes the key, uh, key press and takes the ASCII character code, gives it to the, the register, the SPI register. So it starts writing and then it will drop because we're, we're receiving something when we send something. We have to send something to get something. So we drop the byte that we receive and then it goes over again, goes to the next key. So as I'm pressing keys on the keyboard, it's taking the ASCII character code, it's sending it out uh, the data register, and then it's, it's uh, dropping off what it gets back because it's just garbage. So as I'm typing on the keyboard, I'm sending those ASCII character codes over to my slave Nano. Okay, when you're writing code on your microcontroller for the SPI bus, it's nice to know if your code is working properly. When you send a byte to the data register, is it being shifted out properly? Now there are some scopes that, that could actually decode SPI packets and you can hook up a scope to your Nano and see if you're getting the right uh, packet being sent. But if you don't have one of those scopes, you could do what I do. You could cut off the slave part like that and then jumper the output, the master output, to the master input. So it's feeding back on itself, like a dog catching its tail. So whatever byte you send into the data register, it's going to be shifted back on itself and when you read that register it will be the same byte that you sent. So it's one way you could troubleshoot if your data is being sent properly out your master uh, line. Okay, I have my nano in loopback test mode where I connected my master out to my master in. So now when I send a byte to the data register it should loop back on itself and we should see the same byte. So I'll send a byte, I'll send 33 I'll write that. You can see we got 33 back. My smart OK prompt is actually reading back what we get back. So I could drop that. I could take it off. Now it's gone. I could send another byte. I'll send 56. And we get 56 back. So now I know that my code is working. And when I send a byte into the data register, it's actually being sent out properly. Okay, so that was my little primer. 
on the SBI bus for the AVR microcontrollers. So now you can write your own code instead of downloading a library or a sketch. And every time you see SPI in a book, you're reading about it, or if you're talking to somebody about SPI bus, just picture that circular buffer in your, in your mind, how you have those two shift registers and they go in a circle when you're sending out the data. Now it, instead of using a, another nano for your slave, there's all kinds of uh, modules you could buy, like an accelerometer or an SD card or a serial EEPROM, where you could hook up to the nano and try out the SPI bus protocol.